My name is Teresa Tasevich, and this is a sneak peek into an exciting new study on adolescent decision making. Now, teens are typically described as being impulsive risk takers who are incapable of making good decisions. More often than not, these poor decisions are associated with a heightened sensitivity to reward during this period. Recent studies suggest, however, that teens are quite capable of waiting. However, it flies in the face of a lot of prior studies that have shown teens always being risky or impulsive whenever incentives are involved. Specifically, it seems that incentives can influence behavior in different ways. It can impede, but can also enhance it. Many of these studies, however, have been plagued by two very common issues within developmental research. One is whether or not the incentive used is equally valued across age groups and not more rewarding for one group than, say, another. Second is whether improvements in one group relative to another are real or if they're confounded by ceiling effects. For example, if an enhancement in performance by rewards is seen in teens, but then not adults, it may actually be due to the fact that the adults were already performing near ceiling. So in the following study, we looked at how rewards affect decision-making across development while trying to control for these issues. Now to do this, we ran teens and adults on a decision-making task while collecting both behavioral and neuroimaging data. We specifically use a paradigm called the random dot motion task since it allowed us to equate task difficulty across age groups. It also allowed us to easily introduce a reward component um, to a widely used decision making task to kind of help us better understand the way rewards influence decision making across development. To give you a better understanding of the task, the participants were presented with this array of randomly moving dots, where a percentage of these dots are coherently moving together in one direction or another. The participants were then asked to indicate with a button press whether the dots were moving to the left or to the right and told that they would be rewarded for answering correctly. And as you may be able to see here, in this example, the dots are moving to the right. Now, each participant's trials were divided into easy or hard trials. For the easy trials, a larger percentage of the dots were moving coherently in one direction, making it easier to tell which way the dots are moving. For the hard trials, however, a smaller percentage of the dots would be moving together in one direction or another, making it more difficult to tell the overall direction of motion. Now, throughout the task, we held each participant at either 92% accuracy for the easy trials or 63% accuracy for the hard trials. We did this by subtly increasing or decreasing the difficulty of the task depending on the participant's performance. For example, if a participant's accuracy was above 92% on an easy trial, the subsequent easy trial would be made more difficult by decreasing the percentage of dots moving together. On the other hand, if the participant's accuracy dipped too low, the task would then be made easier. In this way, we were able to match difficulty level across the different age groups. Next, in an attempt to make the reward equally appealing to both teens and adults, we use a point system as opposed to money or some other potentially age-biased incentive. Um, so in this case, the subject for a correct response would receive either one or five points, and that larger five-point reward would always be associated with one direction, which the participants learned within the first run. So since we hope to examine the effects of reward on decision making, we are interested in both reward and decision making regions of the brain, including the ventral striatum for its role in detecting and learning about incentives, and the dorsolateral prefrontal cortex and interparietal sulcus. Both of these regions have been implicated in representing the accumulation of evidence prior to making a decision and then the subsequent selection of that choice. So with this, we hypothesize that first, both adolescents and adults would show the expected reward bias, specifically that they'd have shorter reaction times on trials associated with the large reward. Second, we expected to see an enhanced reward bias in adolescents that this, and that this bias would be seen in the ventral striatum as an increase in activation to large rewards. What we found, however, was an age by reward interaction where adults showed the expected reward bias, but the adolescents were actually slower to large rewards, almost as if they were waiting to be certain before making a choice when the large rewards were at stake in order to maximize their gains. In the ventral striatum, we see only a main effect of reward, with both age groups showing increased activity to trials uh, that were paired with a large reward. 
In contrast, the behavioral interaction that we saw was paralleled in both the prefrontal and the parietal cortex. Again, two key areas involved in the accumulation of evidence prior to making a decision. Now, as you see here, the adolescents show increased activation in these decision-making areas to large reward trials, and it coincides with their longer reaction times. So this suggests that contrary to some characterizations of adolescents, teens are not simply driven by impulsivity, but are capable of waiting before making a decision when large incentives are at stake. Now to learn more about these findings, you'll just have to read the article. Happy reading!